Before I do, though, uh, talk about NMD, as we call it, New Media Dramaturgy is NMD, um, just a little bit about uh, who we are. We're the PhD program in theatre at the City University of New York. Uh, we're part of a, 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 a graduate centre of about 16 or so PhD granting programs, including philosophy, including history, including uh, art history, English, uh, modern languages, sociology, so on and so forth. And um, we, we work with PhD students. Uh, so the City University of New York is a very large university. Uh, we have some master's students, and perhaps Nick will mention that a little bit later on, that uh, there is a master's program in philosophy at, at, um, at, the, at the Graduate Center. But we mainly produce PhD students, and so we're in a very privileged position. Um, we also, in the theatre program, work very closely with uh, my colleague Frank Henschke from the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre. And Frank is going to take you through some of the uh, many activities that that centre does. But just to acknowledge that the future of research is, is actually engaging with practitioners and engaging with practice. And one way we do that at the, at the Graduate Centre is to work very closely with the Siegel Centre. Uh, who produce extensive uh, amounts of public programming. And Frank and I, over the last couple of years, have formed this kind of conversation around dramaturgy as a key word. Dramaturgy as a research modality inside the PhD program. So we have a number of students working on dramaturgy of contemporary performance or dramaturgy of dance, um, but also dramaturgy as a way of investigating and doing practice and thinking dramaturgically about practice. And so. One aspect of that is what I'm going to talk about today in this, uh, in this hopefully not too theoretical paper. Um, so we'll just go uh, move through the slides. And, uh, that's a great slide. So the presentation's in three parts. Part one's going to try and define a little bit uh, what I mean by new media dramaturgy and what we what we think we've we've developed as a as a concept. Part two is looking at that concept in relation to two case studies uh, that kind of bookend the narrative of new media performance, and I'll come to that in a minute. And part three will be just some very, very short um, uh, uh, observations and conclusion, concluding remarks. So, begin with an anecdote. I went to drama school in 1978, uh, and in 1978, the drama school's philosophy was that even though you might be training as an actor or a director, you learned everything. You learned how to do the lights, you learned how to do the sound. And so everybody had to take a, a, a practice, a, a kind of craft task alongside a, an acting task or a directing task. And so we learned how to make, do lighting design and sound design. Um, but this was all pre-digital. And so it was, in fact, you know, relatively simple uh, to, to, to do lighting. You, it wasn't simple to, uh, design a nice state of lighting, but to operate the equipment was actually relatively simple. You had very few levels of control. Your lights came on, you had a degree of gradation from 0 to 10%, 10% uh, being full bright and 0 being full dark, and then you could mix them through with a huge board that, you know, some, in a big theatre, the board, lighting board would be as long as, you know, this, this long, um, and you'd have series of Sub, sub ranks and stuff like that. Um, in um, 1994, I was sent to the Adelaide Festival of the Arts to interview this company, Dumtype, from Japan, who are a, a, a very important company, or were a very important company, making new media performance. Um, and I went in, I was to interview them for their national broadcaster in Australia, and I went into the theatre where they were doing their setup, their tech run, and sitting in the front row, there was the director and the choreographer and the sound designer. But sitting in the front row were four young guys with laptops, um, quite big laptops for 1994. But essentially, they were using laptops to program a series of video effects that were in synchronization with the moving bodies, that were in synchronization with the sound, and that were actually in synchronization also with a series of uh, slide projectors. And it's the first time that I'd ever seen laptops in a theater. And of course now we, we don't go anywhere in a theatre without a laptop, we can't. And to think back on the kind of lighting design that I learned in 1977, there's no way I could operate a lighting board now. It's a highly complicated, specialised task, 
and you're not only operating the intensity of the lights, but you're also operating how they move and how they move in relation to each other. And there's various kinds of lighting now to create you know, incredible effects. So we're really seeing a transformation in the theatre that has been happened in the last 20 or 30 years. And it's this transformation is digital media, it's digitally based. It's all about uh, turning what used to be analog effects, lighting, sound, presentation of bodies, projections, and so on and so forth into digital effects. And they're kind of just all concentrated in this one moment in 1984, 1994, sorry, 10 years out, uh, where you, you walk in a theater and you see the laptops on the stage. And um, as uh, we did a, a book about dumb type, uh, called the Dumb Type Reader, and we interviewed the technicians who made this show. And they talked about the fact that what they were doing was so new that they had to actually hotwire the computers to the data projector because the computer itself only had a printer port. <laughs> computers were made to print things out, not to send transmit images to data projectors. And data projectors in those days were very large and very difficult machines. Um, so they really invented a new set of protocols, a new system for the making of theatre, and over a number of shows, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, they uh, pioneered what we would, what we call not only a new media aesthetic, but also a new media technology. They made these kind of things possible to happen in a, in a live theatre space, combination of live action and media in a reliable, repeatable form, uh, was something that evolved over the 1990s. Uh, and now it's very reliable. You know, everybody puts their projection on in the theatre even when you don't need it. You just put it there because otherwise somebody might complain. Um, so, thinking theoretically though, we came back to a set of practices or a set of ideas that were espoused by uh, a well-known Belgian dramaturg named Marianne van Kirko. Uh, Marianne began her artistic career as a dramaturg in the 1970s and 1980s. And she worked as a pioneering dramaturg uh, where she made links between performance and dance. And she worked as a dramaturg with some very well-known artists like Pina Bausch, uh, like um, uh, and, and Teresa de Kiersmarker from the Roses Company, and like William Forsyth, all of whom were producing this new language that was between traditional theatre, theatre that told stories and had actors on stage pretending to drink cups of tea and, and, uh, and you know, basically projecting out into an audience who were watching a kind of fourth wall. And dance, which was much more about embodiment, about sensuality, about uh, feeling something, giving something to an audience that was feeling-based rather than narratologically-based. And so she was one of these pioneering figures who started to explore how the vocabularies of those two forms could start to mix with each other. And therein lies the link to dramaturgy, because essentially when I talk about dramaturgy, I'm talking about the recognition of vocabularies, building blocks that make theatre. That's what dramaturgs do. They look at the building blocks of the theatre and they give comment on that, or they write about the meaning of that. And so Van Kirkhoven had this you know, very insightful kind of thing, and again, she was writing in 1994. It must have been a good year for people rethinking theatre. In a, in, a, in a journal called Theatre Shrift, where she said she wondered about whether there was a dramaturgy for the movement sound, light. And she had a big list, sound, light, bodies, set design. And so she suddenly made a shift in our thinking out of this idea that dramaturgy only concerned itself with the narrative or the structure of the text, and into the need to think of dramaturgically about the, you know, what we would call in theatre studies the mise-en-scene the whole experience of the stage. So we started to have to think about what happens when a story exists with a very powerful sensory experience coming through the media. What happens when um, things like lighting and sound, which do give very strong sensations to audiences, can even overpower uh, uh, the, the, the story, the so-called narratological story that the, that the audience might be watching. Uh, what happens when artists are consciously using media to interrupt story and so on and so forth. So this is a very important observation and it really, she, she coined the term new dramaturgy as opposed to, we could say old dramaturgy is associated with the theatre of Bertolt Brecht 
prior to that. It's a very German tradition. It's uh, associated with uh, G.E. Lessing. And indeed, dramaturgical theories go back to the ancient Greeks. How do you make a well-made play? You have a good beginning, good middle, you have a rising climax, but you make sure it's resolved at the end. It's all neatly tied up. That's a kind of classic dramaturgical frame. You make sure the actors uh, have a certain kind of unity uh, of time and place. They don't just suddenly step out of character um, and be somebody else. Now, of course, all of these things are broken in contemporary performance. They start this idea of dramatic unity, this idea of a well-made play. It's all contested in this period in the 1990s when contemporary performance comes to make this uh, claim on, on, on you know, contemporary practice. And so alongside that comes new dramaturgy, and alongside that comes the need to account for technologies. So Van Kerven wanted to talk about a dramaturgy of things, a dramaturgy of spatial relations, a dramaturgy of spectatorship, a dramaturgy of artistic intentions, a dramaturgy of aesthetics, a dramaturgy of work. Artists started making theatre about making theatre. Everything became very meta in the 1990s, and suddenly you had theatre that was about theatre, that was about the vocabulary of theatre. Artists, dancers started talking on stage, dancers weren't supposed to talk, they were supposed to dance. Um, uh, actors started dancing. Um, you know, we ran a company from 1997 to 2010, and we were a theatre company, we made contemporary performance, and half our actors were dancers. We employed <coughs> roughly half came from acting schools and half came from dance schools. So uh, we, we needed that kind of uh, uh, association with the body. So new media dramaturgy is a framework for both analyzing and creating contemporary new media performance, including multimedia theater and dance, video performance and installation. And the important point here is that the field of performance itself is now situated between uh, theater, dance, music, and visual arts. We can't really talk about a, a, a kind of conventional theater anymore. Because when we go to the theatre, we watch installations, or we watch dance, or we watch what we see, in, or we watch reality TV. You know, what we see in theatre now has dramatically changed from what it was like uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s. So here's my second beginning for NND. The first one was 1994, and this is 2008. And what we're talking about here is a work made by Chunky Move Dance Company in uh, in Melbourne. Uh, but made in, in association with uh, a, a European uh, computer programmer named Feder Weiss, Feder Weiss. Um, and what this was, was a, a, an interactive system where the dancers moved through the space and they were literally tracked by the lighting. Mm -hmm. And so you have this capacity for dancers suddenly to be highlighted and lifted out of the space because the the, um, the lighting that they're using is tracking them and, and the lighting is changing its focal length and, and beam in order to highlight their bodies. Or alternatively, what they did in this is that they projected black light onto bodies surrounded by white space and so you had this sense of negative space where dancers were doing their kind of dance form but indeed uh, they were kind of dark amorphic blobs. And it's a very powerful example of interactive media and live performance. Technically, what's happening is that there's a, an invisible screen being projected onto the stage, which is like a, a grid, and the audience can't see it as UV light, but computers can read it. Mm -hmm. And so you have, as the dancer moves through the screen, you have a tracking of the body and all these external features in real time um, with a lot of computer programming and then that data is transmitted into uh, a program that is programming the lights and the lights are varying their focal beam according to the, to the program. Now, the interesting thing here is, is um, um, the stage manager on this show, who was also a stage manager for our theatre company, once told me the story about how they didn't know how to call the show. Stage managers are trained to call the shows in a very repetitious, highly controlled manner. So essentially what they do is they go, you know, uh, the next lighting cue might be Q10, so they go standby Q10, go Q10. And they're telling operators to do same for sound, they're telling artists when they enter and when they exit, it's all very, it's very precise and very controlled. And here, 
they had these amorphic black shapes sort of rolling across the space and they, they couldn't, they, there was no precision. And so they, um, they came up with a new protocol and they called it Q Black Shadow. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you Q a black shadow as opposed to Q lining Q10, you're dealing with a much more amorphic, um, fuzzy kind of experience. So in, in a sense, what we're talking about here is not just an artistic um, invention where uh, the theatre itself becomes much more focusing on a kind of set of in-between or intermediate or uh, liminal states. We're also talking about the fundamental protocols that are running the show, having to deal with this kind of uh, vagueness or this kind of new, new sense of ambiguity that is being made possible in the theatre by the technology. So Cube Black Shadow is a really good example of that, I think. So on the one hand, we have the invention of laptops, and then we, a decade, 12 years later, we have the, the capacity to, to actually manipulate the media uh, in real time using the computers. And of course, the computers are much more powerful, they're much more reliable, so people can do this with confidence that it's not all going to break down. And so, um, so you know, hence we have this experience of, of, of NMD coming into the force. Um, a good example of this is the work of Ike de Diorgi, and uh, uh, perhaps I'll leave the PowerPoints, and if you want to look at some of these websites, uh, please do. Uh, Ike de is the sound composer who worked with Dumtype in the 1990s. He's now a performance and installation artist who works mainly in large exhibition halls. And what he does is he creates uh, really disturbing interactive systems for human subjects. And so using uh, very uh, immersive and aggressive uh, video projection of data, he, his, his basic language is data itself. Uh, and he creates these enormously immersive spaces with soundscapes and subwoofers that transform according to where the person is in the room. So this is indeed a theatre without live actors, or the live actors are actually the audience, because the way the space transforms, the way that the drama evolves, is, is through the movement of the bodies of the actors. So that's uh, another example. So NMD is thinking dramaturgically at the level of theatrical structures, and it's thinking about presence and affective qualities. It's thinking about the materiality of theatre. The actual substance that makes theatre, you know, we don't think about light as a material, but it's very important. You take away light or sound, theatre can become very boring. Um, it creates uh, a certain kind of bedrock for the emotional experience of theatre. And in our book, we look at all of these, uh, these ideas, these, these key words, and I won't read them out there, but, uh, um, just so that you can orient yourself, because I do want to look at the case studies. So, I've prepared a, a little bit of a bookend today, old and new, new media dramaturgy. So we'll look at the old and then we'll look at the new. And I've kind of prefigured it a little bit because the old is dumb type and the beginnings of uh, NMD. So dumb type were a group that began in 1984 in Kyoto, in, in Japan. And they were a group of uh, mixed media artists. They came from dance, uh, cultural theory, architecture, computer programming, uh, uh, graphic design, no actors, no theatre directors, they hated theatre, they were really opposed. They came out of a kind of visual arts world and they created a kind of installation that moved. Uh, and they also dealt a lot with politics in their work. They were very concerned to create in the images and media that they created a kind of dialogue around uh, the transformation of contemporary society. It's called PH, made in 1989. And this is um, uh, an image here, so you can imagine that the audience is on three sides looking into this white pit, and, um, and there are two beams moving constantly back and forth during the performance. The upper one has projectors pointing down, uh, and the lower beam has a white line uh, that is like a scanner beam of a photocopier or a scanner. 1989 photocopiers were still sexy things, I guess, but, um, um, but certainly, uh, what happens is that the dramaturgy of the performance is completely determined by the movement of these beams, because the lower one is about this high off the ground, and so the dancers either have to jump over it, or light their choreography has to incorporate some way of lying down so that they are literally scanned by the, by the, by the white light. Um, 
And um, they also have from the top bank these projection of images down onto their bodies. And it's uh, um, things like barcodes and uh, global iconography. And, um, and, and you know, they're very much thinking about uh, a kind of um, a theoretical landscape of information. How do you think about information overload in, the, you know, the, in 1989? a very long time ago now, but it's the beginnings of postmodern theory, it's the beginnings of several key texts in cultural theory by people like Frederick Jameson, by people like Asada Akira in Japan, um, uh, and who are, who are observing this transformation of society because of digital media. And they're saying, well, how does society change? And one of the ideas they came up with is that it changes because we become data. We become inscribed with the data. It, it just walks on us. And um, so this is a performance that attempts to demonstrate this, um, this idea of information overload. And the idea is that it enters the body. They talk about how it transforms the body itself through an awareness of globalization, global iconography. Um, it's stuff that we just take for granted. It's part of our everyday world now. It's, our bodies have already been transformed by this. So there's kind of no going back. But this is a, a, a very important moment in identifying this new cybernetic system that transforms the human body and they made a show about it. Um, then in 1984, they made the show that I opened with, the show SN, which is, a, which is pioneering the new media aesthetic with the combination of video projectors, slide projectors, immersive sound environments, and, and uh, monologue presentations. This is a work that was actually made in response to um, the uh, announcement by the artistic director of Dung Tai Teju Furuhashi that he had contracted HIV AIDS. And in Japan, there, there was very little knowledge of this at this time. Um, and so they made a project that was both an artwork that attempted to explore uh, both the medical and social and political and cultural perspectives on, on HIV AIDS, but also they created alongside it a whole series of public events, discussion events, um, uh, scientific <coughs> debates, because this is very early days when, and in Japan there was an enormous resistance to acknowledging the existence of, of HIV, so this was a very uh, social, uh, political intervention as well. Um, the performance, as you can see, uses these kind of beautiful medioscopic images of bodies, scanning bodies, because part of what happened in that period was that <coughs> bodies were turned into, they were objectified as <coughs> bodies, they were others, they were pilloried, they were, and also they were dying. People were dying very, in very large numbers because this, at that time, was an incurable disease, and, and people didn't quite know why people were dying. And so they uh, interrogated all of these contexts for making this work and they found all these ways to present it in a multimedia format. Um, they read extensively the work of Michel Foucault's The History of Sexuality and they used texts from that very visibly in the performance and they had this uh, kind of utopian resistance to uh, HIV AIDS where they projected a series of texts about the dream that the gender would disappear, the sex would disappear, the disease would disappear, the money would disappear, the world. And it was a very utopian statement about uh, the possibilities for a future society that would be uh, uh, without disease and, and more constructed around the ideas of, of utopian love. And, you know, they kind of, they really did this very seriously. And they would have um, a lot of AIDS activism around this event and, um, and also the work to it very widely around the world and presented us with this remarkably powerful sense, sense of imagery. And the final work that I'm going to speak about was the work uh, following the death of Teji Furuhashi called OR, which was a, a piece that was made in memorandum to his life. And it tried to imagine um, the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the border between life and death. Now, this is a country that is a Buddhist country. It has certain ideas of, now these are, these are hip young hipsters from Kyoto. They're not going to the Buddhist temple every day mm -hmm. and, and saying their prayer sutras to them. But, but this is a country that is deeply informed by a, a, the sense that when one dies, one is in a, in a karmic cycle of, of the possibility of, of rebirth and return. 
So, um, but they came up with this remarkable work where they imagined, you know, what happens when you die? What happens, how, do you, how do you put that on stage? How do you, I mean, theatre has always been about death on a certain level. How do you actually put that on stage as an experience in a way that interprets, that uses the audience? And as you can see, they're using a mixture of uh, by now very sophisticated projection systems, laser systems, immersive sound systems. You get it, the orgy was putting subwoofers under the seats of the audience. So when you're sitting there and you know you're feeling death, that you're coming out, your whole body is shaking with this experience. And in this beautiful sequence here, which you can look up on the YouTube, um, a, a woman Shikata Yukio is standing in a, in this kind of surround projection system, and she disappears into this journey from the mountain to the sea. It's a very poetic metaphor for the life flashing before you before you die. Um, and you know, again, I have to stress that these were pioneering moments in new media performance. They were really uh, taking us to a new awareness of the possibility of media and also shifting the perspective of the audience from a kind of dialogic uh, perspective to one that is about affect. It's about the feeling of what one experiences. And it's about creating disturbance and un un uncanny feelings. So my final uh, example of the newer NMD, with the stump type, pretty much finished around about 2002. Um, uh, the newer experience is uh, Chris Vadoc, a Belgian installation and performance artist who makes works that are installation arts and robotics and, uh, and works very much with the idea of uh, of there really being no difference between a live performer, a machine, an object, a, 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 a presence of smoke or light. For him, he drawing on the work of um, actually uh, uh, Kleist's uh, essay on the Marian in theatre, uh, a very old text from the 17th century, is it? Yeah. Um, uh, he, he develops a theory of, um, of, of this sort of leveling out of the difference between objects and humans on the stage, and hence the link to new materialism in the title of our book, because new materialism is exploring how increasingly in the 21st century in an ecologically devastated landscape, differences between human and non-human agents are actually uh, becoming less. And so we have a number of theorists uh, who are talking about this in, in, uh, in many in philosophical texts, but also in political texts as well. And he's very much drawn to that. And he calls his, his, his uh, performers robots, humans, objects, figures. And that's also a reference to the class, but it's a, there's a second reference to a famous essay by the philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who talks about the figure in this, uh, figure between life and death in Auschwitz figure of the, of the uh, imprisoned Jewish subject who was um, still alive, but basically one step from the gas chamber. And, and Agamben, who is a theorist or a philosopher of ethics and, and, um, and, and what he calls states of bare life, um, refugee bodies, uh, figures in Auschwitz, he uses these very traumatic images and experiences to elaborate on a philosophy of ethics and politics. And so this figure of between life and death uh, is something that also is brought into a consciousness of the way that Chris makes his work. And so in his early works, more installation than performance, we have Vox, a glass cube that uh, it, it, its audience enter the space and it lights up very slowly and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter so, so you can't look at it anymore. It's so bright you're going blind so you have to put on uh, dark safety glasses. And meanwhile, there is a theatre text by Heine Müller being uh, uh, broadcast into the space, which is uh, a text from a, a piece called Media Material, which is about uh, decaying life in East Communist uh, uh, Germany. So, um, a second piece in uh, two actors in very large glass fish tanks wearing um, uh, oxygen. Uh, um, breathing machines, um, but very comfortable. The water's uh, actually heated to body temperature. They're standing there with their eyes completely open. They don't blink because they're in a kind of almost embryonic state. Um, and their clothes are weighted so that they don't rise up in the water. 
And it's very uncanny because the audience can see them, they can't see the audience. And it's, you know, it's sometimes when you see a fishbowl, the fishbowl magnifies the clarity of the detail of the fish. A similar thing happens here. And there's a, a whole text or discourse around this work about the, uh, the artist looking back at the audience, uh, which is an, an act of projection because, in fact, the artists in the, in, the, in the thing can't actually see the audience. But uh, they themselves report feeling very comfortable. Um, Chris then went on to make uh, uh, a series of works, um, many different works, but he created a work called Act of One, which was in three parts, staged in a theatre. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole idea was that this was a new way of thinking about theatre. It had three parts. The first part is mass. Um, which I'm just going to show a little bit of. Um, and there are no live actors in this theatre, but, but the piece is called Actor. So clearly we're asked to think about what it means to be an actor in the 21st century in theatre. <coughs> and the first scene is actually called Mass. And uh, we, we stand for about 20 minutes watching the generation of an atmosphere. It's very beautiful, it's very calm. It's slightly disturbing, it's got the low, low edge sound. Um, but it's like, you know, one could think of it like watching clouds or um, being underwater, looking up at the, at, the, at the surface of the water. It's very calm. Um, and Chris talks about this as being an actor. It's generating affect, it's generating a story, it's generating a certain kind of drama. We don't quite know what the drama is, but we're very anxious because of the underbelly of the sound mainly, but it's, it's increasing in its tempo. So if you want to make an audience feel anxious, just start a sound on a very slow, dramatic build up in its intensity, and everybody will be getting a bit nervous. Horror movies use it all the time. Um, and then the second part was called Humanit. The soil, similar to any matter. This is a back of the text. Oh, of course, breathing. Um, in between images, but not nothing. And, and not what we're actually looking at here is a, um, a holographic dream. image of an actor done about this Death size dust, in dust, absolute dream. clear detail. So we walk into a second the space in the theatre, and we see this very realistic um, holographic the copy of a human actor. The sky, but third size, unfinished body, standing, doing the doing the back of text. His grey head, nothing. An image. The third section so, is called yeah, yeah. Dancer 3. attached to the, to the dancing at robot that can't perform its task properly but really wants to. Uh, it, he sampled the voice of R2-D2 which works very nostalgically for all the people who love Star Wars. And here it's trying to do a little Spanish dance, trying to impress the audience and try, being an actor actually, trying to impress the audience. But of course, like all actors, what they're actually doing is kind of impossible, so... But then the machine makes them get up and do it again. So, um, so Chris has this, you know, this idea of what this work is doing is taking us through various states of acting. The first one is, is a kind of an affective state of, of, of mass and of uh, the mist. Uh, which is a physical presence in the space. The second one uh, relied, refers to the concept of the, um, of the humanit, uh, it, which is a, inspired by the homunculus, a, a medieval construction of a small person, a little bit like a golem in 
some respects, but without the same those magical powers. Mm -hmm. But uh, a European idea that's also, to do, it's actually a Greek idea, it goes back to Greek antiquity. Um, but it's also alchemical, it's about transformation. And then we have the idea of the dance of three. The performance involves the objects, it tends to jump in the air. Of course, it can't do it, it's a redundant gesture. And the audience can't help but relate to the object and to humanize it. Mm -hmm. And to treat it, they go, oh no, or they laugh, or they, they feel very sad when it can't complete its task. And it's a machine, it has no feelings. So it's clearly a machine. It's clearly in a repetitious kind of psychotic system almost where it's designed to fail and as Beckett said, fail, fail better. So and um, Beckett said, and I'm gonna skip gonna go right to the end now. Your time, your time. Um, this is the, the most recent piece that uh, Chris has made called Conversations at the End of the World, where there are live actors on stage. And there's a live concert pianist on stage as well. And they act, they perform texts, they tell stories, they play music at a very high level. These are some of the top actors in the Belgian scene. Um, and the musician, he's a, he's a world-class concert pianist. And they know that they're on the last day of the world. And what happens is they fill the time in a very Beckettian kind of way. They just talk to fill the time. They tell stories, uh, they play music, and um, and then this, this this dark gray snow starts to fall. About, it's a 90 minute performance, about 40 minutes in, the snow starts falling and it's incredibly beautiful. It's so beautiful the audience is lulled by this beauty. And they keep performing, they don't seem to acknowledge the snow, but slowly, little by little, they're buried in it. And, uh, and this is conversations at the end of the world. And so we have this depiction of the end of the world. This is a piece that is obviously referencing uh, the issues of climate change. Uh, it's a deeply philosophical piece because it's, you know, it's about what um, the uh, Italian Marxist theorist Vito Verratti calls the phenomenology of end, our fascination of the experience of the end times. Uh, and so coming to part three, just to summarize, um, New media dramaturgy is somewhere between machine and image, between what Marianne Van Kirkhoven calls, in relation to Vedonk's work, the need to listen to the bloody machine. And so when Vedonk makes a work, he says, I need to listen to what the machine wants to do. Whether that machine is an actor, a human actor, or a, or a machine that is built, uh, the, the task, the dramaturgical task, is listening to the machine, listen to the apparatus. And those of us who are philosophically minded, knows that that then in turn signals a whole set of dialogues around machine-like society, apparatus, uh, systematic you know, discipline. It references several well-known uh, philosophical perspectives on contemporary politics and society. Our, and what Shikata Yukio describes in relation to dumb types work uh, as the image machine. And so now, I think when we go to the theater so often, we're watching an image machine, we're watching something that it operates on a, you know, on a dialogic level, but it also very powerfully operates on the level of image. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that was absolutely marvelous. I would like to remind you, uh, because I neglected to, to mention it, that next Monday um, at 5 o'clock here, we'll be screening a documentary film about August Wilson, an uh, absolutely extraordinary uh, American playwright um, and one of the most important African-American writers of the 20th century about his work. And the next night, uh, Tuesday, then we'll uh, have David Shumway from Carnegie Mellon talking about uh, uh, August Wilson's work from his new book on realism. So please try to come to that if you can. Now I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Frank Hinchker, who's a, a great friend, uh, as well as uh, an extraordinary uh, scholar and curator. Um, he holds a PhD in theater from the Theater Institute in Gießen, uh, Germany, and uh, joined the faculty of the PhD program at uh, 
uh, in theater at the Graduate Center, University of New York in 2009. Um, he currently serves as Executive Director and Director of Programs at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. And for those of you who know, it's across the street from the Empire State Building in New York. It's you know, one of the key sort of centers of culture on any given night. New York, you're likely to go see Tom Stoppard or Naomi Klein or John Sayles or, you know, uh, giving lectures and the Siegel Center, um, which uh, uh, Frank has uh, curated uh, events of all kinds over the, the last decade, has some of the most interesting and innovative theater from uh, all around the world. So I could sort of list some of the the different um, uh, programs uh, that he's done, like Prelude and, and Pan World Voices and so on, but I'll let him do it. But um, uh, it's a wonderful sort of uh, complement to what Peter's done, focusing on this one particular area to talk about the breadth of what you do. We have a long-standing relationship, I should say. Uh, I first met him in 2008 when I took Shawad al the Iraqi playwright, to do his play, Hamam Baghdadi, off-Broadway in New York, and Frank invited uh, him to uh, the Siegel Center, and it began a relationship which has evolved, in a certain sense, into this memorandum of understanding, which is sort of expanding to a Nick in the philosophy department, I hope, uh, and certainly media studies and others, uh, I hope. So it's wonderful to have you here, too, Frank, and uh, please. Representing in a way the writers at the CUNY and the City University of New York, in the City of New York, uh, and what it stands for and what we are up to. So it's kind of a uh, little um, just sharing of our experiences and, uh, and uh, what we do. This is the outside uh, facade of the um, writers at the CUNY. It used to be a department store, something like Galerie Lafayette in Paris. It went broke. And now it's a big store in a way still of ideas where people come in and get something, but it's not something commercial, it's not something you buy, it's not like in Dubai where it was yesterday, you know, you buy a lot of things, here you get a lot of things, but it's kind of immaterial, it's something for your brain, and, um, and that's, uh, I'm so honored uh, to be part of that uh, uh, um, 21st century uh, factory or uh, workshop research lab, what you would call it, at the Quite Center. So they actually 30 PhD programs, 30 centers that communicate with the city. The city university is paid by taxpayers for the people from New York. Uh, 1862, it was founded. People, normal people, could not go to Yale or Harvard, it would be possible to get in. And they said our kids should also go somewhere, and they called it, we need to have a city university. It was first called Free University, now it costs uh, a certain amount of money, three, four thousand a year, but nowhere close to the sixty thousand at the NYU in Columbia. And uh, we are very proud of what we do. 80, over eighty percent of all first-time uh, um, African American, Latin American, Asian Americans who go to the universities come to us. And it has over twenty colleges all over the city. It's on a big umbrella. It was created in the seventies after the financial crisis. And this is a little bit the ground jewel, as Peter said. It's the PhD program, and it's a Fantastic um, uh, building to be. I hope this is um, the right one here. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a little bit uh, very fast uh, what we do at the Siegel Center. We perform our knowledge of the Living Archive, the Research Nexus, Global Network, the British Academia, the theater communities, a global dramaturgical research center, and it's a home for students, uh, scholars, artists, and theater audiences. But what does it really mean? These are all words. It's easy to say, it's easy to write in the paper. Um, what we are interested in uh, is uh, knowledge, but also what do you do with knowledge? I spoke with Nick about uh, my, my family is a knowledge and the universities, and my dad uh, left school when he was nine years old. He was a displaced person. And uh, he didn't like that I went to, um, to find my three last year gymnasium, I went to university, he was very skeptical. Said, what about all these professors who were the Nazis in Germany? How come? There were workers who were against it. He said his father was against it and who died in one of the factories. What's knowledge good for? Just always remember that. 
And I think that's a good, good thinking, and I think it's something what we do in the theatre world. We say, what do we really do it, and what do people do with that knowledge? And that is significant. How does understanding take place, and what is the meaning of what we do? This is of importance, and speaking of philosophies, you know, that come to the next idea, Kant famously said, a German philosopher, we look at the reality and uh, think well, that's real, but he says there's no, nothing like really reality. Look at the three horses on the meadow and they're grazing. You already need to be able to count. You need to know what's a horse. You need to know why are they eating. So there is nothing you just get into your mind. There is a lot of things which we already have preconceptions about. And why is theater interesting? And we just had a talk at our Prelude Festival. I'm going to come to that later on. Uh, someone who started us as theater director, and now she works in cognitive science, and she had gave a talk, and she said actually she could scientifically prove what's good theater. And, uh, and she said it's all about uh, cognitive reception. She said contemporary theater, or most of the theater, is boring. It doesn't do anything to your mind. It's like sugar, basically, for your brain. She would say all these kind of stories of individual fates, you know, like your divorce or your mom dies and the dead baby in the backyard, all that stuff. It doesn't really do what theater or the science are supposed to do, challenges us to get a better understanding of the world, a better meaning. She said, we have to irritate, we have to tell stories that make us wonder, that bedazzle us. And in that kind of confusion, understanding takes a, a Play. She says, you know, for example, Richard Maxwell, a New York theater artist, people would tell a story and how they emotionally express it has absolutely nothing to do with what they say. It's actually the contrary of it. But this discrepancy between that is makes you listen and watch. Uh, a, a Japanese director, who Peter also knows, he came first to the Seagull when he was very unknown as now a world star, Toshiki Okada famously has actors um, do their own work. They um, have to uh, talk about their house and when they grow up and the gestures like I'm doing now, he tapes them or they remember them, or another actor watches them, they redo it. Or they do it in character, but then the father takes the gestures from the daughter and, it, and it's a, it makes up something that makes it interesting. And it challenges our minds. So this is these three things in a way as examples what we do when we try to achieve so we understand where we come from. And we really need to understand better the world and we only get glimpses of it. And I think theater is a fantastic way to, to do that. So this is our home page. Um, um, what we uh, do. This is a little bit our international programming um, of um, uh, what uh, where we show uh, artists work from and I mean, we are all interested in people from everywhere, minority languages, small countries, from places everywhere. If people come from Britain, we will be less interested if someone says I come from uh, Botswana or I come from Lithuania or I come from uh, Burkina Faso, we are much more interested because it's not known. And they might know something we don't know. I don't know if it works. Um, I did put in a hyperlink today, but I don't know if that It's probably not really, it's too small. So, um, how do I skip from that? Um, no, it's just loading. Yeah. It's just loading, you know. So, this is our current, uh, current website of um, uh, what we do, our events. It's a little bit too, uh, too short, so I'm, I'm not going to do it um, close all. Because I have links to all the sites, um, but I could also. I can just email them to you. So this is, um, these are programs, it's already a couple of years old, but these are gives you a rest. So I don't think very few institutions, even in New York City, in New York City almost, I don't know, 600 languages are spoken, people come from everywhere. But when you see on stage, are mostly stories of white people, white men mostly, mm -hmm. mostly European, it does not reflect really the world. It's called the melting pot, but some say it's the melting pot that never melted. <laughs> And theater, at least we try to understand that world that is, that is so complex and difficult uh, to understand. As uh, um, Robert said before, we do a couple of programs we are known for. One is called the Prelude Festival. So we had actually now 15 years, I created a Prelude Festival for New York theater artists. New York artists 
have a hard time showing their work. They don't have a theater of their own. Everything is kind of a rotating uh, 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 a show, uh, uh, a show basis. International groups come from everywhere. Also, American uh, productions are 90 to 95 percent commercial Broadway theater. This is how it's dominated. If you go to New York City, um, it's really commercial. Uh, 90% of all, everything that's shown are musicals on Broadway and then what the European theater take for granted where the subsidized theater does not really exist. So if you are an experimental artist, as Saha would be um, in New York City, she would have a hard time getting, on, getting a Broadway show with all the millions of dollars investment. Uh, um, the uh, Lion King has now created $8.5 billion, Wicked $5.5 billion. They, they're done by Disney and Universal Studios. Both film companies never made as much money with any of their films as we see things. So what we are interested in again is experimental work, people at the forefront of the people who do that look at things differently. And we want to understand better what they are doing and they're making a real contribution. This is research. Uh, thinking, theater making as thinking is doing, like when you see a Japanese design, beautiful object, it's kind of a philosophy in an object, how it's done, how it's presented. Germans may be better at writing it down and ideas, but uh, to put something into a form, and this is what theater does, is only just, and so we invite 20 to 30 artists, groups, companies to show works in progress, 20, 30 minutes excerpts, we have scholars talk about it later with us afterwards, and they also create a community, and that is another point. It is like extremely important. We create communities in New York City about the people, about the scholars in New York City, CUNY scholars, international artists who come to us, who talk to us like we do, trying to create uh, something here with um, AUB and be part of a better understanding of the of the of the world. Um, we are involved in a festival that's called Pen World Voices, where each year we are invite between 10 or 12 uh, playwrights. They come to New York City, we fly them in, the American directors rehearse the readings, the actors read it, their discussions afterward, it's part of the Penn Festival, you know, Penn, the writers' organizations, and poets, uh, editors and novelists, I think was in the first call, and I wrote them and harassed them that they include theater people that didn't have any in the first years, and of course we know that writing is of significance, and perhaps there's a little renaissance also in New York that stepped away from it, but. Uh, uh, so we have uh, uh, people from uh, Argentina, Germany, uh, from France, uh, from, uh, from really from everywhere, from all the countries, and um, it's kind of most of the most significant gatherings, significant playwrights in the Americas. Our tiny little center. I'm the only full-time person. And two people work their half time, but uh, nobody invites them really or brings them over. And if you have institutions in New York, mostly they invite people that they think of a little second or third world and help to rewrite the third act. And we say, no, these people know what they're doing. We should learn something from them. We can learn something from them. They have realities to talk about where we have no clue about. Then since a couple of years, we uh, created a festival. I created the festival because I felt, as Peter so uh, beautifully explained, uh, the, the boundaries and disciplines are merging and uh, theater are certain on screens, with screens, for screens, for film, video, projection, not just as wallpaper backdrop, but it's a really serious dialogue. So this is theater work, create a film work, a work for the screen, created by theater artists. So never a film rehearsal, but a uh, um, uh, um, work for the screen, and uh, all documentaries about theater makers. Um, I have the website here. I took out all the lineup. They like 25 or 30 films in three days. A little bit insane. Nobody comes uh, <laughs> because people can't take the time in New York. But we have a puppet play from Taiwan as that we thought was interesting, or a, a Belgian choreographer who's super famous. Uh, there. But here people haven't heard of them, Bardelus and others. So, but it's a play. Your film we showed, right? Your uh, documentary on the uh, site specific. Want and Tom, so uh, we show the um, 12 Angry Men. Right. Uh, we show, we show. Which one? Check out the Check and and so, we, so, so we have, we are a place where those things uh, find a home. This is our normal lineup of the season. This is uh, actually this one in September. We had towards our dramaturgy where 
uh, Saha and, uh, uh, and um, Robert came over and talked a little bit more about this in collaborations, AUB, the Prelude Festival, two very significant artists, one from Norway and Germany, who were the Volksbühne in Berlin, got thrown out basically the first time they would ever show their videos. They are like superstars in Berlin, <coughs> experimental, dance, experimental theater, significant people. Uh, Orhan Pamuk is going to come, Turkish uh, uh, novelist and Nobel Prize winner. He's the first adaptation of his work, which he allowed. And then we were asked something about black acting, theater of the real. It's Carol Martin um, will actually turn also and talk with Jan Favre. Uh, the Magnificent Peony Dreams is about Chinese uh, uh, Kungju opera and Chinese traditional opera, revolutionary opera, and it's about a choreographer who lives uh, in New York. Very big thing, a Japanese playwright project. We invite four Japanese writers, the best ones selected by a committee in Japan, then by a New York committee, so we always ask people to help us what to do. So I'm not really a curator, I'm more like a traffic cop. I say, yes, you do this, you come on here. And we have a student project, 50 years after 68, that they're creating a sit-in uh, an Austrian choreographer will do a participatory dance session about democracy. It's on performing knowledge. And on device theater, one of our students uh, who works at the public theater will uh, talk through the mechanics. Most theaters are set up to produce plays. They have a very hard time producing what Peter talks about, the installations, um, or even site-specific work, or um, work that you would find in an art a, a gallery. Italian company and um, about publishing. We also publish a lot of other talk about, so we honor very small uh, uh, presses. This is what we just did what, two weeks ago, uh, when was that? And this was our second uh, collaboration um, for this AUB exchange. First, we invited Sahar to hard to come over and talk about her work, a great, a brilliant uh, um, documentary theater project uh, in a way about um, the, um, about the, um, it was Syrian refugee women who uh, were uh, enslaved uh, as, as sex workers in a uh, courageous project. So this is uh, what, we, uh, what we just did. And now normally I would connect to the website, but we had two days. We had uh, theater artists, um, 15 uh, or 14 come and speak, and also uh, academics and researchers. Three of the most significant, the most significant, I would say, American, Arab-American writers came. Uh, so the Lundi and um, and uh, Lila Bach and others, and we looked at the talk. Heather Raffel. Heather Raffel came, yeah. So this was a very significant, very first time ever that they, they kind of got together this, and very first time that they kind of, of dramaturgy came in. This is also Peter's influence of working at the Graduate Center. So, and I think it hopefully will something going on. And I spoke to Robert, I think this AUB here could also be a center of dramaturgy and uh, End of um, uh, connections. Here are some photos of it. There's Peter speaking. Uh, there's uh, uh, Sarah, who's a Turkish researcher. Uh, here it's an after party. Here two people. I don't know who they are. <laughs> uh, left, uh, and um, at the, the target yeah, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is what we just did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we presented, as I said, you know this. Uh, contemporary talk with it. And I just want to give you a little overview. This is from our annual report, maybe because we also have to go after money and get support, and I have to do fundraising also for it. And, um, and then we write annual reports, which is actually interesting. On the left side, you just see institutions in one year, of how many we worked with. On the right side, these are just names of researchers, like academic researchers, all in one year, like two semesters. Um, this is the number of artists who came in, not just as visitors, but people who talked or made a contribution in a discussion. Um, uh, I think it's quite, uh, when I look at this, I can that be true? Uh, did we just make something up, but it's <laughs> actually it really uh, is. Next to uh, our work um, uh, in presenting events and connecting, uh, um, connecting uh, communities, we also host visiting scholars from around the world between 8, 10, up to 14 sometimes. And uh, here you can see some of the names uh, where they come from. And this is Iran, Iraq, it is China, it is Taiwan, Belgium, Germany, France, everywhere. Uh, people can come to us between three months, six months, some stay for a year and do research on something there. have to work in uh, New York um, uh, research uh, uh, 
institutions, uh, libraries, or they even do research in American theater. So we are a host. It's very easy with us uh, here. These are uh, from this semester. We hold Mondays roundtables. And let's see, someone in Japan, India, Romania, UK, uh, Italy, Australia, Japan, Germany, Switzerland, Brazil, China, Indonesia, Egypt. I mean, it's from one year, actually, I think. Um, so, but um, this is just people who come through, who we engage with, listen to, and also get suggestions for what to do. And um, this is another little branch out of uh, Marvin Carlson, or colleague has a Carlson theater center, which is in Shanghai, which we are established in relations with, hopefully the center has been kind of opened. We are just working on, so Peter's working on it to get a five-year plan approved. That's what Mao did, I think, and so we thought that it would work uh, to get some financial support and make a little track Yes, and um, so the idea is to have, you know, have something ongoing, um, and uh, uh, we played a part in it, I think one of the, first uh, researchers that came was a PhD student or just had finished his, came as a visiting scholar, loved what we did, and, um, and it, a, a very big exchange uh, came out of that. We also helped to suggest the idea, and um, like Robert said, theaters often are communities, other ones, even in between these two universities, CUNY and AUB, we the one where it starts. We also have publications. Um, this is our publication side, it's books and journals, uh, uh, 20 books. We are the foremost publisher of uh, Arab texts in English translation, our tiny institution, what we do at the site. There's no even Nick Hong book has less in London. So it's a significant work we think we do, like really print plays from Tunisia and uh, Syria and uh, Egypt and Jordan, wherever. So um, we have to research uh, the websites of the digital initiatives here. And we go here, they have that some of the books we put out, actually I put out and helped to. So I don't know very little most of the time of what's really in there and I trust a lot, but I produce them, put them together so the work is um, um, uh, practical work. Then we have two, three online journals, which I also a little bit overlooked, but collaborate, but also it generates a lot of work. Is um, One is uh, Journal of American Drama and Theater, which is very academic. Uh, uh, research more kind of a traditional journal, but I changed them all when I came. They were all in book form, and I had to order them. And I said, it's the time is over. They should be open source, free access to knowledge. So these are websites we designed. I helped to design the, the, the pages, and every year two to three editions um, do come out. So let me see if I can go um, to European stages. So the idea also is that people who go, it's all about what you see on stage. So it's not on theater history, it is not about reflections on, on um, what uh, a researcher might think. So more, if something has had to happen um, on stage to, uh, I don't know, it's here are the articles, you know, you can click on any of them, Berlin Theater, Theater Treffen, um, the images do change, the homecoming martala. So you want this to be an article, and sometimes the little videos are attached to them. Um, so it, it really looks since uh, many, many years at the European um, scene. Um, and if anyone of you, um, Barcelona, ever has a suggestion, you can submit an article. The other thing I did with Marvin, Marvin, of course, Carlson is the more of the expert in our uh, theater for a very long time has engaged in dialogue, mostly on on, um, on the playwriting and, uh, uh, and uh, traditional forms, and uh, less on dramaturgy, but has been a fantastic uh, performer. He's mostly the biggest expert on worldwide on Arab theater outside the Arab country. So we have um, Arab stages, which also has reports from uh, uh, theater in the Arab world, or diaspora and that really looks at it, we can submit articles. So for many people this is quite a significant um, resource on, um, on um, oh gee, uh, it doesn't really work, you know, so these are, this is volume 8 and this is, you know, here you can see some of the articles. It is quite um, extensive, we have quite a lot of People. So um, since we are here, maybe we can show you also what it is about. You know, it's devoted 
broadening awareness. And uh, it doesn't seem inclusive. This is kind of a, a, a statement. Uh, what we just need to see, we really have a deep engagement in that, that it goes out into the world, into the global world, into connections, into people, into artists' work. And, um, and um, if you see also on the um, example, this is just one part, as I, as I, as I hopefully communicate rightly to you on our work here. Um, you see the advisory board. Here's some resources. I harass people, you know, to put on websites and archive. What's our advisory board? Oh well, um, it's a uh, 25 people on it. So, and, and I hope you also will join. The people are in here, and it happens. Uh, electricity goes off. Yeah. It doesn't. Mean it's nothing I said. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it is your fault. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. It didn't happen with Peter. If you're having trouble with that mouse, mouse, you can huh? use the actual mouse as well. If you're having oh, trouble. Oh, that would do. So what if? What do we do now? We uh, it'll come back on in a, a minute. Yeah, it's actually from you Peter's, you know, Chris Van Donk to uh, deepen the research. Now we are also thinking creating small, more documentations in kind of a book form, even in a low edition or print on demand, but they will um, be available then as PDFs, we distribute them for free. So that knowledge really um, goes around. And I think this is a, something which we will engage deeper with podcasts. I think we will do much, much more and come in there. Maybe also host um, lectures or interesting things, one of our projects, you know, that you don't have to travel somewhere or have to get into this special seminar at Yale to get to catch that great talk, so to create um, other things. We are also part of my very, very end of an organization from Belgium that's called OnTheMove.org. It's a European uh, initiative that say the mobility and cultural mobility is the most significant thing that we can do and engage now in a way when we bring artists over that move, that's the world, how it's called. And um, uh, we have, there are guides, which I would like you also to look at for Europe, Asia, and North Africa, where you can apply for research money or artists or university students, but who are connected to the, the arts uh, can go. People put together like on the food label, every grant that exists that's out there, we took over the American part. Nobody in the big America wanted to do this. They resisted to the end, but then we did it because uh, at least for the performing arts, and um, there's also one for Arab countries, and if you if this projection with up, it shows you here, these are just the A's, all grants that are available, which can be used to come and do um, the work that we do. So it was also a big part of us, we hosted a conference around this, very successful one, and um, next to many, um, many other things. And now I wanted to get back to my original slide, which you saw, you know what, what we do is we do is performing um, our knowledge. It's a living archive. Theater we engage with the New York Theater History companies of the Marble Mines or Rich, Richard Foreman, Shackner, people who in, have made a contribution. So we do create communities and works around them. It's a research nexus, it's a breathing global networks of communities. It's British academia and theater and performance communities. It bridges American and global theater. It's a global dramaturgical research center. And it's a home for students, scholars, artists. Uh, and uh, theater audiences, people who love theater, come to us and uh, really like to know more and often do say they understood or see something different, something more. So we, in our evenings, which I see also as shows, we put one evening shows, but they are like artists who come, they give a talk, there's a reading, there's a video, then there's a discussion, then there's a Q&A, so it's also dramaturgically, in the sense, we engage how to make that work, how to do that, and uh, so I see this as my uh, theater productions, or performance productions, and they only happen one evening, and then they're gone. And uh, I think um, it is something that, you know, also AUB could play a role, a very significant one in the Middle East, from what I understand. You have the interest, perhaps even small, but some resources, and you have uh, also connections, and with the theater lab, which you are starting, you know, I think perhaps to work in the dramaturgical sense uh, with that group and out of our conference, maybe have a network of Asian, uh, of, um, of Arab dramaturgs, which then could be in communication with European and Asian and African ones. So you enter kind of a global community and I think to host um, and bring people over because people want to know also what's, what's happening here and uh, what we do. So I hope I didn't speak too long. No, it was perfect. Yeah, I apologize for the technological glitch. 
my suspicion is that by turning off the noise, I can't turn on the projector. Um, but I decided we'd live without it. But that yeah. was absolutely marvelous. We have uh, time. Of course, more. it's much longer, but I cut two hours off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, a couple of questions, uh, if, if you had them, um, it would be wonderful. I should reiterate that uh, um, we know firsthand um, uh, how important you are as a nexus. And people think New York is a very cosmopolitan place. And in certain respects, it is. When it comes to the theater, it is not. It's really amazing how narrow the spectrum is of what you know is performed in, in theaters in New York. And um, you're one of the, the a few exceptions to that. And it's, on any given night, um, uh, practically, you can walk into the Graduate Center and see things that you would not see anywhere in North America, or you know, um, and and uh, so you know, for those of you who know the U.S., it's actually rather insular in the way that Australia is, Brazil is. It's a world unto itself. So even the Lincoln Center uh, International uh, Theater Festival, which was one of the few festivals uh, that was uh, a venue for international theater it evaporated when it was canceled, you know? It's like, uh, uh, whereas uh, if you're in Europe, if you're in Latin America, um, uh, you are used to encountering all kinds of uh, cultural production from everywhere. This is not true in the US. It's really, and you think, oh, well, it's a melting pot or there are a lot of people. In fact, one, uh, uh, would be surprised how narrow the spectrum of what you see is, and a lot of it is commercialism. Um, but this marriage of, of the university, certainly the marriage of the university and uh, scholarship and practice is one that we, we very consciously copied. When I established the theater initiative here at AB, I came and talked to Frank and said, you know, we're trying to put something together here that marries the two. And uh, you, we, it's allowed uh, Sahar and I, for example, to do all kinds of theater that you otherwise really couldn't do. There's nobody else doing it in town, and we do it in a very different way. And uh, you know, we're not trying to make money. Though we've lately gone, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should. But you know, um, in fact, that's one of the uh, beautiful and extraordinary things uh, here is uh, you have so much going on that um, inevitably some of it's very interesting to some audiences, some less so to others, um, whatever, but uh, on, a, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, again, these barriers that we see too in terms of discipline here between fine arts, uh, media studies, uh, you know, literature, uh, theater, they break down completely there. You know, it's sort of, it is the manifestation of what Peter was talking about too. So instead of giving a further harangue here, if anybody has a question, that'd be great. If not, um, uh, we're so happy about this collaboration and uh, um, we're really hoping to expand it uh, more. It's been uh, a real huge success, not just in theater, but I think arts, culture, whatever, and we're so very happy to have you here. And the other thing is, of course, we did do something on our end in the spring. Um, too, when uh, Marvin uh, Carlson and Jean Graham Jones came for the play that Sahar directed, The Blood Wedding, in um, uh, here in Havana, and uh, two of your graduate students mm -hmm. um, also came and participated in the conference. So um, uh, it's a, a, a thriving relationship, and I hope it continues to. So. Yeah, and we are grateful to the uh, Graduate Center CUNY and the, the, the board of directors who gave a financial contribution so our faculty and students could come here, we could invite Saha, we hosted a, a conference on our dramaturgy. I think we also in the Speaker Center next to our time organization is very complicated actually. We put in also our resources. So it is a serious engagement. Um, I think the Arab world is in the news so very much. Um, we need to know more. What we hear is, again, like stories everybody already knows and they're not the real ones. And um, so your center is a very unique one because you have, it's a big obligation, I think, and responsibility. People want to know more, people want to uh, come here, I think, people want to get also impulses, perhaps, from theater that have that got lost from an Arab tradition. Um, and 
and uh, it works so good. I think, um, I hope that uh, this is the beginning of a long uh, collaboration with well, us, but I also... Peter, I hope you can come back and talk about Japanese theater. Not yeah. only what Thanks you talked about, thank you yeah. so much, David. Um, not only what you talked about today, which is absolutely fascinating and a lot of uh, yeah. things I knew nothing about and was very happy to know about, but to have you come back and yeah. talk about other aspects of Japanese, yeah, obviously that was woven into what you did. But, um, if you had enough money and Chris Long has time, you could ask Peter and he might come. You know, yeah. to the show. Yeah. It's now it's easy. He'd bring the jumping He would, right? <laughs> Peter, Peter, he would. Yeah, yeah, he, would. he would. You know, it's like many, many others. So I, that's why I think this is really as a model. Why is theater interesting? Because it's a model for something. Something happens, in a, whether it's an atmosphere or an idea or something on stage. It happens on stage, it can also happen in life. And this, when something like this happens here, it stands for something much bigger and much more significant than just this event itself. And that's why it is even more important. Again, thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful. Thank and uh, thanks for sticking out, sticking with us.